Everybody is for change in general and against it in particular. And people like it when it works out, but if it requires any effort, you have to be prepared to pay a short-term political price. And I grieved, literally grieved, for years that so many people lost their seats in Congress in 1994 because we were seeing the beginning of a pattern which has persisted, broken only in 1998 and in 2006. Thank you, Mayor Emanuel, when you ran the campaign for the Democrats in Congress then. But of the, our party not voting at midterm. But the truth is, it worked out pretty well for the American people. And last night I was watching CNN and a little trailer came on and said, after they killed all these members of Congress because they voted not only for the budget, but for the Brady Bill, background checks, and the assault weapons ban, that now 95% of the country supports comprehensive background checks and 65% would support an assault weapons ban. And so that still doesn't mean that you could survive it voting for it. It all depends on who shows up. So one of the great things about the challenges we both face, I think, is in national campaigns and in governance in the White House, is to realize that between you and the people you're trying to put first, the further you move away up the totem pole, the more layers there are between you and the people. And the more difficult and challenging it can be to communicate. So you can't be undisciplined about it, and you can't be weak-kneed about it. You've got to keep trying to break through, keep trying to break through. Never stop trying to explain. Never stop trying to reach people. It's a big part of the job, and frankly, one that after I got in, I underestimated. I mean, I was governor, as my distinguished opponent, whom I came to love, said in 92, of a small southern state. So the idea of being in touch with all your people was natural and inevitable. When you're president or when you're running for president or when you're secretary of state, it requires strenuous effort, often against forces determined to see that you can't communicate with people. So that was all very exciting. It worked out great for you, but let's not forget, change is not easy. And a lot of people check their careers at the door to make America a stronger, safer, fairer place. We also had, in addition to all that economic progress, 25-year low in the crime rate, a 33-year low in the murder rate, a 47-year low in the illegal deaths by gun rate of all kinds. And so if you listen to other people say, oh, it was just an accident in the economy, if you believe that, I got some land I want to tell you. <laughs> so I thank all of you who made that possible. So, Mr. Clinton, I want to go to this your area, one of your areas of expertise. I, I think the economic successes of the administration would people remember, but when I was going to the library, I noticed that there's this Mandela exhibit. And I wish that you could talk for a few minutes about some of the foreign policy successes we had and talk a little bit about Mandela and about some other things, because I think there were some real foreign policy achievements that tend to get overshadowed by the economic achievements. So if I'd ask you to start off and the President, please chime in. Well, James, that, that's right. And I, I thank you uh, for raising it, because uh, if you look again at the eight years, um, the United States played a major role in some significant uh, foreign policy successes. Uh, let me just name a couple. First, uh, the Irish peace process. The Irish peace process would... <laughs> would never have happened without Bill deciding that the United States was going to back it. And that happened because of the campaign. You know, when he was trying to get support and people were still trying to figure out who he was and uh, what uh, he had done in Arkansas, he had a meeting with Irish Americans uh, led by a, a, a man we both knew from our law school years. And 
one of the requests was, if you get elected, would you be willing to play a more active role in trying to end the troubles? And Bill said he would. And it was, again, a risky decision. I remember very well, he decided to give Jerry Adams, the head of Sinn Féin, which was seen in many ways as the equivalent of the IRA, a visa to come to the United States. And there was an enormous uproar of opposition from the English government, from our own ambassador in London, from people saying, no, don't do this. And I think Bill rightly said, look, you've got to take risks for peace. You don't make peace with your friends. You make peace with people with whom you have serious uh, differences. He asked George Mitchell to uh, be the negotiator. It went on for years. There was nothing fast and easy about it. He didn't tweet about it. He got to work about it, and he actually got it done. Another important uh, action that was taken involved Europe, and it involved the Balkans. Uh, you remember the horrific war in Bosnia, where it was almost a precursor of some of what we see in the world today, where disinformation and the media are used to sow discord and set people against each other. And you'd had uh, Serbs and Croats and Bosnian Muslims, the Bosniaks, living peacefully together. You know, Sarajevo hosted the Olympics a few years before. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was this intense effort to blame different groups and individuals within those groups, and a war started. And it was very difficult for the Europeans alone to figure out what to do about it. And again, you know, Bill said the United States, with others, not on our own, would try to end the war in Bosnia. The late Richard Holbrook was the chief negotiator, and he did uh, an extraordinary job in, you know, really cornering Milosevic. And they were able to craft a difficult uh, resolution. Of course, it was hard, and there were still outstanding issues, as we saw later in Kosovo, when Milosevic began to uh, deport Kosovars out of Kosovo. I went to the refugee camp and saw these people being, you know, they'd been loaded onto freight trains, too terribly reminiscent of what had happened uh, in Europe in the 30s and the early 40s under Hitler and sent out of Kosovo. And again, you know, Bill said, we're going to, we're going to end this. And he ran a bombing campaign against Serbia. And he forced them uh, to end their uh, deportation. And Kosovo is an independent country. Now, they still have a lot of problems in the Balkans. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, these are really difficult, terrible problems. He worked incredibly hard with his counterparts in Israel to try to come up with a solution to that very challenging set of issues. Uh, he was at Camp David with Prime Minister Barak and Yasser Arafat. We all remember the incredible photograph of the Oslo Accords being signed in 93 on the White House lawn. And from that moment forward, Bill worked to try to find resolutions and ending you know, conflicts with Jordan and creating uh, more uh, support for Israeli security and recognizing the uh, desires of the Palestinians. Camp David got close, but not close enough. But it was a consistent, concerted effort. You know, when you think about that time, probably one of the really bright spots, I think, for the world uh, was the election of Mandela. And Mandela became a... A, a leader whom I list as among the most admired people I've ever met, and within my understanding of history, uh, ranking right up there. Uh, he became a close personal friend, an advisor, a mentor, uh, 
and his example of how to pursue truth and reconciliation is something that I wish more of the world uh, would pay attention to. So there's, there's many other things, but, but those are the ones that I uh, immediately think about, and maybe you'd like to add some ideas as well. Well, I, I wanted to just make a couple of points. First of all, since there are so many people here who not only help to elect us, but help us to govern, uh, the only thing that compensates for the president being vulnerable to be blamed when the sun doesn't come up just right every day is that you get an unfair amount of credit when all the people who work for you do something good. So I want to thank everybody here. You too, Hillary was talking about the Balkans. One person who played a big role in the Balkans was Wes Clark, who was Dick Holbrook's major aide when we were trying to do that. In everything that we did over eight years, there was there were somewhere between one and literally a hundred people who deserved major credit for the good outcome. And so I want to point, point that out. The, the people's willingness to serve in public office, which may go up and down depending on the way they perceive it as a good or not good thing to do, is very important and had a lot to do with it. So I wanted to say that. Second thing I wanted to say is, the, Hillary made all these points and then talked about Mandela. Why do we love Mandela? Because he's not like what we don't like about today's politics, right? In today's politics, conflict is more important than cooperation. Attacking people and demeaning them and debasing them and dividing them is more important than treating them with respect and lifting them up. Mandela was in prison or house confinement for 27 years, and yet he always treated people with respect and tried to lift them up and tried to bring them together and succeeded in doing it. Instinctively, I think most Americans who care about their country and its role in the world know that ever since the end of the Cold War, when the bipolar world of the former Soviet Union and the U.S. went away, and we could have fights without blowing each other up to kingdom come. Even with the rise of terror, even with the rise of all this, that there, it's been more profitable at home and around the world for many people to act like our differences are more important than our common humanity. And most people who say, oh, that's wrong. I want people to work together and be reasonable and compromise. They may be, but they don't vote that way very much. You know, why? Because sometimes we take our democracy for granted. We take our public servants for granted. We expect people to come and do it, and then our election time comes up, and we want somebody that they think is just, you know, playing to our fears or our anger or whatever. Don't do that. Because one of the things that I think everybody who's governed since the end of the Cold War has learned is the world is interdependent. We have to find a way to share the future. That means we have to have shared responsibilities, but we also got to bring the opportunity for economic growth to everyone, for personal opportunities for their kids, for mobility, for social security and cultural dignity. And so far, it's a lot of ragged, there are a lot of ragged edges because we say one thing and vote another. And we were navigating all that. So I want you to think about that. We did, we worked like crazy to try to bridge all these divides. The final thing I would say, which is not necessarily in our interest, but today when we're all celebrating, there's not much the United States can do to make peace in a place if the leaders at the, in the local region don't want to make peace. You can help a lot if people are inclined to do the right thing. Then you can maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. 
and help to pave the way, which is what I tried to do in all those situations Hillary mentioned and several others. But first you have to have, as the great American poet Carl Sandburg said, you have to have rich wanting, you have to want. You have to want this thing to work out. That's what I pray will happen for all of you and anybody you can reach. We can't let this country go away. We can't let our divisions eat us alive. We can't trash our democracy and rob our children, our grandchildren in the world of the chance to do that. You have to want it. So. Uh, I think one of my favorite moments in the campaign took place at the governor's mansion in Arkansas when we introduced Alan Tipple Gore and named Al Gore your running mate. And talk a little bit about that, and I wish that both of you would address this, but I know it's something you're very passionate about, is you were identified with the issue of the economy. He was in, uh, really identified with the issue of the environment and took a little bit about the environmental record and Al Gore and also going forward with people like my family who live in a vulnerable place like New Orleans are very passionate and very concerned about this issue, and I think it's worth elevating up there with well, the economy and foreign policy. Yeah, I think today, you know, people don't think that much about it. But it was a groundbreaking choice because we were the same age from the same part of the country in the same wing of the Democratic Party, and I picked him because he knew more about things that I did, certain things. I knew more about economics and education policy and sort of state-federal relations, and Hillary knew more about childhood development and education, but Al Gore knew more about information technology, uh, nuclear and other defense issues, and the environment. I read Earth in the Balance when it came out, and uh, I thought there's no point in having this job unless you're going to make a difference in people's lives and prepare for the future. So we just, that's what we did. And a lot of people thought it would be a big mistake politically. But then when, uh, it was interesting because when President George W. Bush ran for president in 2000 and picked Dick Cheney at the time he did it, he might, he seems to be taking a different task a little bit now, but he was part of that neoconservative group. But the idea became more current that the president and the vice president should be in sync. And I think that's pretty important because there's a surprising number of presidents since the history, of our, since our country began, who were unable to finish their terms. And therefore, you should pay a lot of attention to who the vice president is. I thought Hillary made a very good selection of Tim Kaine from Virginia, it's her vice presidential running mate. Because they saw the world the same way and because he had extraordinary executive experience and he always did things, got things done. And I personally think we, had, we need more of that in Washington. I, I wanted to just um, add on to that about uh, the environment. You know, um, Al Gore has been a persistent prophet uh, about climate change and about the risks that we face. And uh, I, you know, I, I really admire that the work he started as a senator, that he tried to continue as vice president. He still continues today. He has another movie out that is trying to change public opinion and not only change public opinion, but change the decision making of elected officials. So here's where we are now. Um, when uh, Kyoto was signed, and Al represented the United States at the signing of Kyoto, um, Al and Bill had great hopes that they would be able to persuade the Senate uh, to go along, and those hopes were dashed. And it was a bipartisan dashing. You know, both Republicans and Democrats uh, decided... 98 to nothing. <laughs> yeah, 98 to nothing. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't get more bipartisan than that. Um, <laughs> And, you know, there was this idea, which Al was so committed to trying to disabuse people of, that somehow trying to deal with the very threats of climate change would be bad for the American economy. 
And both Bill and Al tried during the 90s, despite a big uh, resistance, uh, to make that case. And then uh, in the years after that, there was a brief moment uh, under George W. Bush when we thought we could make progress on climate change. Uh, I traveled around with John McCain, for example, and we went and actually looked at melting glaciers. Uh, we went to Svalbard, the northernmost inhabited place uh, in the world, to you know, talk to their scientists. And we went to Point Barrow in Alaska. And, and, and McCain really tried to put together uh, a group of Republicans to work with Democrats on these issues. But here's the lesson. You know, climate change is one of those issues that a lot of people care about, but it's not their number one issue. It's like gun violence. A lot of people really care about it, wish we would do something about it, but not everybody sees it as their number one issue. So if you have a really determined, well-funded minority view that does nothing but try to prevent you from taking action on something like climate change, it's hard to make it a voting issue. And what happened when uh, President Obama came into office and I was honored to be Secretary of State is we decided we were gonna try to make it a voting issue. We were gonna try to do something about it. And I went off to Copenhagen and we made a commitment that the United States would uh, be willing to help fund uh, climate science research, help fund mitigation efforts. Uh, the president joined me there. We had a really contentious meeting. It was incredibly difficult. The Chinese and the Indians and the Russians and others were not interested. But we eventually pounded out an agreement. And we got the first agreement post-Kyoto, because nobody was going back to Kyoto, because everybody knew that the developing countries were were growing faster and they had to be part of the solution, but we hammered out agreement and then in subsequent years more and more agreement was reached until finally we got to the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement really was the culmination of so much of the work of so many people including and, and most notably Al Gore. And of course, you know, along comes the new administration and uh, they pull us out of the Paris Agreement and we are now the only country in the world not in the Paris Agreement. Even, uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad, when he takes time off from, you know, murdering his own people, decided he would join the Paris Agreement. So we're the only one left. And we are losing economic opportunities. And this is what is most frustrating, because even back in the 90s, you know, we, we tried to green the White House. Uh, we tried to do things that would demonstrate some, you know, personal leadership. And we also, thanks to Bill and Al, made the case that this was an economic opportunity for America. So, okay, so we're out, you know, the fossil fuel guys are supporting Trump and the Republican Party, and they are more than happy to prevent us from doing anything. And guess what? The Chinese have decided they will dominate the renewable industry. They will be the primary exporter. So these, all these actions have consequences. And I really do, as I said in the beginning, give uh, Al Gore a lot of credit for not giving up and never throwing the towel in, as uh, frustrating as it must be for him. And, you know, right now he's over in Bonn and with a bunch of, you know, American governors and members of Congress who are telling the world, hey, some of us still understand what the stakes are and we're not going to give up either. So the environment was a was an important flashpoint, and oftentimes people forget about uh, the many struggles that uh, the Clinton-Gore administration had. So, Madam Secretary, one of my favorite and the long resume, one of the things that always kind of grabbed me is that you helped found the Children's Defense Fund in Washington. And the President and I were talking about this a little bit early, and I, I think one of the great underheld a conference administration I know you were very involved in was the CHIP. And right now, as I understand it, there is a, a funding crisis that this program is going. If you could please talk a little bit about children in the United States and also CHIP and what it means and why it is so important that this program continue. 
Well, I have to say that my commitment to children's health really took off here in Arkansas when I got involved with the Arkansas Children's Hospital. And I, I was so proud of what happened with the hospital starting uh, in the very first term of Bill's uh, governorship when you know, the hospital wanted to grow so that every child in Arkansas would be taken care of regardless of ability to pay and that we'd have the most sophisticated tertiary care that you could possibly uh, provide. And, you know, with Bill's leadership, with the legislature's leadership, there was a great partnership between uh, the state and Children's Hospital. And we watched it grow and, and flourish and take care of so many children. And so, I saw firsthand what a difference it made. Uh, and certainly with my own daughter, uh, I saw how important it was to have the confidence and the support you needed as a parent uh, to make sure your child was taken care of. So when Bill asked me uh, in 93 if I would work on health care, I foolishly said, oh, I'd love to. I mean, really, I can't imagine anything more important than taking care of people's health care. I remember we had a governor's meeting shortly after that announcement was made, and Mario Cuomo, who was still governor of New York, came and he looked at me and he goes, your husband's just put you in charge of health care. I can't tell. Does that mean he loves you or hates you? <laughs> and we all know what happened. It was incredibly controversial. Um, but it laid the groundwork for what we eventually were able to achieve, both with CHIP and with the Affordable Care Act. So, <laughs> after we were unsuccessful with health care reform uh, writ large, um, I was determined that we would at least take care of kids because during the time I was working on health care, I traveled the country, I met with so many parents. I'll just tell you a real quick story. I was at the Children's Hospital in Cleveland and I was meeting with parents who had children with chronic diseases but who were uninsured. And we were sitting in a conference room and they were each telling me their story and I got to a man who said, you know, I have two daughters with cystic fibrosis. He said, I'm a successful businessman. I've built my own business. I could, in, I could afford insurance and nobody, nobody will sell me a policy. I said, well, what do they say to you when you go and ask them to help you uh, bear the cost of caring for your two daughters? He said, well, I'll tell you what the last, the last insurance company I met with, what the agent told me. He just looked at me as I explained to him what we were up against. And he said, you don't understand. We don't insure burning houses. And the man I was talking to had tears in his eyes. And he said, they called my little girls burning houses. I never, ever got that image out of my head. So I went to Ted Kennedy and um, talked with him about trying to figure out some way to cover kids. Uh, he, with the mastery of the Senate that he always displayed, brought Republicans on board, including uh, Orrin Hatch. We worked to create a bipartisan children's health insurance program that was a partnership between the federal government and the states. It helps take care of nine million kids a year. And You know, it primarily, not only, but primarily deals with families that are working families or even really successful families like the man I met in Cleveland whose employer-based health care doesn't insure them uh, because of pre-existing conditions or because they hit their lifetime limits. Um, and they're certainly making more money than would make them eligible for Medicaid. So they were in that uh, you know, no man's land. So we got it passed, and every year since Bill signed it into law, these nine to 10 million kids have been taken care of. And I have to tell you, I've done probably a dozen book signings on this most recent trip, and all through my campaign beforehand, people come to my book signings or come to my, had come to my campaign events to thank me for CHIP. Uh, yesterday in Austin, today in Little Rock, uh, people came and said thank you and one young man said I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for CHIP. I had cancer as a child and you know 
we ran out of money and we ran out of insurance and thank goodness the CHIP program was enacted. So under, under President George W. Bush, <laughs> under President Barack Obama, CHIP was reauthorized and the program continued seamlessly. Well, this Congress and this White House have not reauthorized the program and states are starting to run out of money because as I say, it's a partnership and they rely on the federal dollars. So by the end of the year, unless it is reauthorized and unless the funding is provided, uh, nine million children and their families will be facing some very, very dire circumstances. Um, so I can only hope that maybe at the end of the year there'll be some sort of a deal um, that will provide that continuity. Uh, but uh, it's a program that I am very grateful for that I had some small role in because of the lives it's saved and the futures it's given to so many kids. And it's the kind of thing we should do to take care of each other and to give every child a chance to live up to his or her God-given potential. <laughs> uh, Ms. Friend, I, 50 years from now, I, I think the thing in, that, you know, the economic achievements, the foreign policy achievements, the environmental, I, I think the thing that you'll be remembered for more than anything else is the Human Genome Project. I, I really believe that, that it would have happened. And talk a little bit about that and it was funded and, 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 and what it is and what it can potentially mean to these young people here and their children and on into the future. Well, first of all, I think one of the most important jobs of the national government is to keep America on the cutting edge of pioneering research and development. And I think that while we were getting rid of the deficit, determined to balance the budget, I wanted to keep us doing that. So I spent $3 billion of your money to sequence the human genome in a big multinational scientific research effort. And then we made a private partnership with Craig Venner, who was pursuing his own private sector sequencing, because I felt that it would have a major impact on the quality and length of life for the next generation and for hundreds of years to come. Assuming we can keep from <laughs> blowing things up. And um, so we did it. Now you can get a genome analysis for considerably less than $3 billion. <laughs> and we know that there has been well over $200 billion of economic activity generated out of that. So your rate of return on your tax dollar investment was about the highest we've ever gotten in the United States for that $3 billion. And so we, what do we know? We know that there are certain genetic variances which put women at high risk of breast cancer. So we know which women should start taking uh, tests earlier. We know we can, pretty soon we'll have the capacity to send every mother of a young female baby home with basic genetic information. We, we're learning, we're very close to unlocking the mysteries of Alzheimer's and, and Parkinson's and other things. So it's really important. And yes, I agree with you that it matters a great deal. But it's not the only thing. I also made in five minutes a decision to put GPS into the public domain. That made a huge difference. A lot of people didn't want to do that. 20 years ago, we started the first cybersecurity unit in the national government, and we should have kept it going. Last year, Israel got half of all the private capital in the world in capital investment in cybersecurity. That should bother you, because even though there are our allies, the United States should be way, way ahead of that in cybersecurity investment, and the Congress wasn't all that interested in it, but this is a very big deal. We spent the first $500 million of your money, this was all in bipartisan way, by the way, in um, nanotechnology. 
And one of the most interesting days I had when I was out campaigning for Hillary was in eastern Kentucky in the middle of Appalachia in the easternmost university, Moorhead State. I went to, they asked me to take a while to look at their nanotechnology program, which they were doing with NASA. With the first $500 million and its successors, we got appropriated. So they're building in eastern Kentucky in the middle of what used to be coal country, eight pound satellites for a million dollars a piece that'll do most of what those $400 million satellites will do. So I went to see this young guy who was clearly supporting her, probably at risk to life and limb where he was. <laughs> so he's putting all the nanotechnology for this satellite into a little box about an inch cubed. And I said, what's that box made out of? And this kid in his hillbilly twang looked at me and said, tungsten. He said, tungsten does real well in outer space. <laughs> I said, how old are you, 19? Where are you from? All right near here. <laughs> and uh, so we talked, and I was on the way out. He said, wait a minute. He said, Mr. President, he said, could I tell you one more thing? I said, sure. He said, tell Hillary not to take it when people make fun of her for saying she's going to put up a half a billion solar panels. He said, actually, I think she's a little low. <laughs> I said, I am not in the United States. I am not. To. And I said, why do you think she's a little low? He says, because before you know it, we'll be making solar panels with 3D printers, just like I made this little tungsten container. And when we do, they'll be cheap as dirt and just as good, and we'll all be free. <laughs> I thought to myself, now why am I telling you this? Because that young man did not feel the walls closing in on him, he felt the walls opening up. So he voted for the person he thought would open the most doors, not the people who would build the most walls. <laughs> now, wanna, now, wait, 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 wait. Why am I telling you this? Because I tried. I tried, look, I tried not to do anything stupid in 92. I wanted to get elected. I didn't, not, I tried to find a, a way to say whatever I was going to say that I knew might be dangerously unpopular. But I did try to level with people and tell them we could not roll back the tides. We ought to be going with the future and building a future we could all share. And we had to be both responsible and opportunistic if we wanted to build a future we could all share. But at the time, it was easier. I mean, we put out this little booklet and in fairness, Paul Sangas put out a little booklet, you remember? <laughs> so you had to have, you know, you had to be kind of a nerd if you supported Sangas or me. And we got over 60% of the vote between the two of us in a six-person race. Why? Because people realized then they were actually hiring people to do a job. And it made a difference if you knew anything. And, you know, it was really important. You were not, you, you weren't being hired I mean, and I owe it to a lot of these people from Arkansas. We, the, we never, we had one month in the previous eight years, only one, where our unemployment was below the national average until the year I ran for president, and we led the country along with Nebraska in job growth every single month of 1992. It takes a long time to turn an economy around. The, the same expert that said we had the worst school system in the country in 78 said in 1992, we had the most, one of the two most improved school systems in the country, thanks in no small measure to Hillary's work on that. And the other state was South Carolina, and I made Dick Riley Secretary of Education for eight years. In other words, we thought these were jobs, and our job was to create more kids everywhere without regard to race or religion or gender or identity like that kid in eastern Kentucky making the nanotechnology.
satellites. So, I want, I want you to think about that because they say that Snapchat's 10 seconds. I felt like a great moral victory had been won for civilization when Twitter announced they were going from 140 to 280 characters. <laughs> I thought, oh, the nerds of the world can rejoice. Those of us who love what, I mean, I, I, you're laughing. But, and I want you to laugh, but I want you to think. Being president is a job. You hire somebody to do a job. You have to say where things are, where you want to go, how you propose to get from here to there, and how we're all going to do it together and benefit together. You have to put people first, but you have to, it's more than a slogan. You got to have some idea about how to get there. And I consider it the greatest honor of my life that first of all, I had this laboratory of training as a governor here for all those years. And secondly, that I got to start at a time when grassroots politics still mattered and when people listened to each other and they didn't just want to think of some new put down. And it wasn't a question of whose resentment was better than somebody else's, it was who had better answers. And in the end, if you believe in putting people first, you have to have an other directed politics. It may not work for the people who are communicating for you in the political media. That may not be the most uh, financially remunerative or emotionally successful strategy, but in the end, that's what counts. And I'm proud of her for getting caught trying to put people first for the rest of our lives together. So, <laughs> I think there's an elephant in the room, <laughs> and knowing me, if there's an elephant, it's this. We, we talked a lot about children, and I think one of the real values that all of us that have been privileged to be associated with you is that we earnestly believed and earnestly taught our children that life was a struggle but at the end of the day, if you prepared, if you worked hard, if you were willing to accept risk, and if you understood that there were setbacks in life, that you would ultimately achieve your goal. This has been a hard year for parents. So try to help us and help these young people how we talk about these things in light of the events a little over a year ago. Well, <laughs> I wrote a book, What Happened? And it's really a book about uh, resilience, personal resilience as well as national resilience because I do think uh, everybody gets knocked down and the real question is, are you gonna get back up? And not everybody will lose a presidential election, but everybody will suffer loss. And so the core of the message, James, that we were told and that we try to tell our kids remains absolutely true. Uh, you have to find ways to overcome disappointment, uh, to find strength, and for me it was uh, my family, my friends, my faith. It was uh, a lot of long walks in the woods, um, yoga, 
alternate nostril breathing, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it was also, um, you know, cleaning my closets, jobs that had a beginning, a middle, and an end, reading a lot of mysteries because the bad guy always got it in the end. <laughs> But trying to fall back on the uh, consistent message that I certainly got from my parents and that, you know, I've tried to impart to my daughter and, and will likewise try to do the same with my grandchildren. Life is not always fair. Uh, the struggle doesn't always go the way that you hoped or planned. Uh, but life is too short to give in to the kind of uh, disappointment uh, or despair that comes with uh, losing or with suffering uh, some kind of setback. And so for me, it was getting back up and taking stock of where I was and where I thought the country was. Because I think also, in this particular case over the past year, uh, the country, at least a majority of the country, has similarly felt uh, that something went amiss. And what I've tried to do, I've got a new organization called Onward Together, is to support individuals and groups that are really harnessing a lot of the grassroots activism and energy that is out there uh, to try to push back against some of the uh, changes that are being uh, imposed from Washington and ultimately win some elections. And I was really heartened by what happened in Virginia uh, about 10 days ago. So I think the general message remains the same, but I also think uh, that we have to be willing to kind of pick apart everything that led to the defeat in 2016. And I try to do that in this book because obviously I talk about the shortcomings I had and that uh, my campaign had and uh, ultimately I am responsible because it was my name on the ballot. But there were other forces at work and it was like a perfect storm. Uh, there was a lot that was happening uh, that you know, was unprecedented whether it was the intervention by the FBI at the last minute for no good reason, or Russia, which we're learning about more every single day, or suppressing the vote, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people across the country unfairly uh, prevented from voting, uh, even though they're just as much a citizen and just as registered and just tried as hard as they could, but couldn't uh, cross the th barriers that have been uh, erected since uh, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. So when I talk about what happened, I'm very focused on making sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, so that's why I am speaking out and going to continue to speak out and I'm going to do everything I can to try to, you know, to try to have an election in 2018 that's about real things. You know, this has been one of the challenges for Bill and me. I'll be just very clear about that over the last uh, several years. You've heard him talk about how much he loved um, getting out around Arkansas, listening to people. I was with him every step of the way. When I did the education standards, we held hearings in every county in the state. I mean, we were so in touch with and able to listen to uh, thousands and thousands of Arkansans and, you know, try to take that on board and figure out, okay, what are we going to do? But we also had a clearer channel for communication. Unfortunately, our body politics immune system has been impaired because there has been a concerted effort starting with the creation of the Fox Network. Uh, it wasn't there when Bill first ran. It was one of the reasons he probably survived. Uh, 
It was there when he ran the second time. It and all of its, uh, you know, associated uh, uh, media outlets who are by no means delivering news, they're delivering partisan advocacy positions, irrespective of the truth, the facts, the evidence. And I think we've got to stand up, regardless of what party, regardless of our own ideological beliefs. A democracy depends upon an informed citizenry that has access to accurate information. And I will tell you that There is no such thing as an alternative fact. It does not exist in, in politics or in nature. And it was astonishing to me the things people believed about me in this campaign. And some of my Arkansas traveler friends and other friends of mine from literally my childhood uh, to adulthood and all of the places that I've lived and worked and they were out there knocking on doors and calling people and they would run into folks or they'd get somebody on the front porch and they'd say, you know, I'm, I'm here campaigning for Hillary Clinton. I've known her since sixth grade. Um, I went to law school with her. I worked with her at the Children's Defense Fund, whatever they were identifying themselves at. And I, and I would like you to support her. And, some, and more times than you could believe, they would get an answer like, well, I can't support her. She killed somebody. I can't support her. She runs a child trafficking ring in the basement of a pizzeria. And my friends would be totally bewildered. And they'd say, no, she didn't. I know her. I've known her for decades. No, she didn't. Oh, yeah, I saw it on the internet. <laughs> and now we know that Russia was sending a lot of those messages on the internet. They were weaponizing information, stealing information, providing phony news. So. There's reason to be disappointed and reason to feel like, you know, we didn't uh, succeed and that's hard to live with, very painful. But there's also a call to action. We cannot let our politics be turned into a fiction that benefits a very small minority of Americans. And You know, I'm going to keep speaking out. Apparently, you know, my former opponent is obsessed with my speaking out. <laughs> Apparently, there was another somebody told me tweet today. <laughs> Honestly, between tweeting and golfing, how does he get anything done? I don't understand it. <laughs> so, maybe that's, maybe that's the whole point. Um, but yes. Resilience is the key. And it's not only the key for individuals, it's the key for our country. And therefore, we have to take every election seriously, not just presidential elections. We need to vote in every election. This 2018 election is going to be really, really important for our country. And, you know, the best antidote to disappointment is to keep fighting and keep working and be successful. And that's what we intend to do on behalf of the country that we love and that, you know, we've tried in our own ways to serve over all these years. So I'm going to turn to the man, the man from hope, the, the peddler of optimism, the man that's always looking, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Talking about tomorrow, tell us at this hour of our despair, why you believe America's best days are still ahead of it. And I know you believe that. You've always believed it. And what do we do? How do we make sure that happens? Well, first of all, we are the best positioned country in the world for the future. So if we screw this up, it will require a lot of willful uh, blindness. And look, in the last election, she won the popular vote. And it would have been, uh, the, and if the voters, uh, we have a slight disagreement about this, about what really happened. If the voters hadn't been told that 
the email, the first email, that she was the most important issue since the end of World War II. Uh, I doubt if the FBI director could have swung the election at the end. I think it was, you know, the, we all got to get back in harness here and try to get ourselves a basic framework beyond which we will not go in arguing these issues so that we're not just out there in la-la land. But uh, I'll tell you why you should be optimistic. Because having lost it, I can tell you youth matters. And we are one of the youngest big countries on earth. You should be optimistic because we have so many immigrants, because like every other wealthy country, the birth rate among our native born is going down to barely replacement level. So in order for us to continue to grow and get active in new economic areas, we have to have more young people. You should be optimistic because notwithstanding what you're told, if you count the documented and the undocumented immigrants in this country, the crime rate is one half that of the native born. You should be optimistic because we have people here from everywhere and if you count all the terrible things that have been done by Muslims expressing violent resentment about aspects of American life in the modern world, their murder rate is one third that of the native born. Now, we got to stop this silliness and get down to the lick log here. If you want to just indulge resentment, you can. The problem with the people who didn't vote for her and don't listen to me anymore and think I'm, you know, gone over to the dark side, is that they live in places not with a lot of immigrants or a lot of Muslims or a lot of people who have been transgender or a lot of anything else, they live in places where there is not enough mobility because there is not enough investment because there is not a national network of broadband that puts everybody in the global economy because nobody will stand up there and say, yeah, our differences matter, but what we have in common is way more important. The genome, which James Carville started with, he said, this will be my greatest legacy. You know what every one of you should know about it? It doesn't matter if you can figure out how we can all live to be 120. Remember this, every non-age related difference in this vast crowd today, every single one, is rooted in one half of 1% 1 of your genome. Now, there are 3.6 billion genomes in a body. So even a half a percent is a substantial number. But it's peanuts compared to the 99.5% that we all share without regard to gender or race or body shape or eye color or you name it. Why then must we obsess for 99.5% of the time about the half a percent of ourselves that are different? Why shouldn't we spend just a little more time? If we really put people first again, we would think about how we could share the future. But I'm optimistic about America because of our diversity and because of what we did in the genome, because we what we are, where we are in science and technology, because we rank first or second in the world among all advanced countries in the ability to fight climate change by generating, generating energy from the sun, the wind, and other clean sources. Because you name it, just name me, one single solitary thing. We're leading the world still in material science and all this other stuff, we got more than enough juice to get back in the front of the pack on, um, you know, internet security, all this information technology stuff. The only thing that's getting in our way is our stupid politics. Our, our insistence on putting, uh, you know, special interests, ahead of the general interest on deciding when we will go and when we will not go to vote based on whether we feel enthused. <laughs> and I feel, look, this is mostly a problem for my party and I am unsympathetic, thank you very much. Stop griping when they take your votes away. Stop griping when they redistrict 
your congressional district and your state representative district, if you had showed up at midterm in every one of these elections, it probably wouldn't have happened. And so do I approve of it? No, I don't approve of it. I think it should be illegal and unconstitutional, but we are getting in our own way. We could build the most modern infrastructure of any country in the world, and interest rates are still low. We can build alliances around the world. We can tweak our trade agreements if they need improvement, but we shouldn't run away from the rest of the world. That's what I think. You should be optimistic. We're the best positioned country in the world. All you got to do is have a politics that thinks about the future of these children here instead of whether you can win a cheap shot by driving a stake between Americans in the short run. Thank you. Otherwise, I, I don't feel strongly about this. I, uh, I, I, that's the two points that I want to make before we leave, and, I, and to me they're very important. The first one is, on the way over here, I got a call from my best friend, best political advisor, Paul Begala, who reminded me that they do, Gallup or someone does a survey of the most admired women in the country. And the person who has won that survey most often in all of its existence is one Hillary Rodham Clinton. So, I kind of thought you would like that. Uh, this is my favorite statistic. I, I came up to this this morning, and then I was on the phone and having doing research, and then I came in, I talked to the president. So I think I'm right. I will probably be fact-checked on this, but I, I think I'm on really solid ground. In the last 35 years, 35 years, a Clinton has run the public office has put themselves before the voters 18 times. President Clinton, 11. Secretary Clinton, seven times you have run. Do you know of the 18 times how many a Clinton has gotten the most votes? That would be 18. <laughs> Nick Saban couldn't do that. Okay. You are in 35 years, you are 18 and 0. So I got to tell you this, somebody somewhere out there really loves you guys. That's a heck of a record. So. James, could I, could, could I, before we, we close, I, I just want to say a, a really heartfelt word of thank you to our team here at uh, the Presidential Center in the library. I want to thank everybody, but in particular, I want to thank Bruce Lindsay and Stephanie Street and Lena Moore and everybody who works for them and with them. Uh, in a minute, we'll hear from Skip Rutherford. I want to thank Skip and the great team at the Clinton School. We are really proud really, really proud of what the center and the library and the school are doing. And uh, we didn't want the time to pass without thanking. And of course, we want to thank the Kampuras family, who've been friends of ours for a really long time, for sponsoring the lecture series. And I want to say, uh, you know, we're very reluctant to start recognizing people. We've already mentioned the Arkansas travelers. Thank you for going not only to New Hampshire, but to Georgia, to Florida, and Missouri, and other places. Uh, there are a lot of people here who were in that 92 campaign. David and D.G. Wilhelm, Frank Greer, and Stephanie Salang. Thank you very much, Harry Thomason, for coming back from California. Um, and everybody was in that 92 campaign. It's different now. But it one thing shouldn't be different. 
we should still be able to talk to our friends and neighbors about things that are about their lives without having people whose sole goal is to gain power by discrediting, disabusing, confusing people and the, abolishing the line between fact and fiction and truth and lie, triumphing. So if you want to think about something for next time, think about how to get people to vote at midterm, and then think about how the next generation can do a better job than I could anymore in a Snapchat Twitter world to create space to remind people, as my great uncle buddy used to say, when people make you mad, they're trying to stop you thinking, and there's something to be said for thinking. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to thank you all. And uh, just let you know that if you don't stop thinking about tomorrow and you never forget that we got to go together and you never forget that our racial diversity makes us smarter and better, that our gender diversity makes us smarter than better, that our ethnic diversity makes us smarter than better, and that diverse groups of people make better decisions than lone genius or homogenous groups. Don't forget that. Now, <laughs> I was thinking about all the people here who've been press spokespeople for me. They were always saying, what's your crazy boss reading today? And what in the hell does that mean? Excuse me. <laughs> but I, that's what I want for you. Ask yourself how you're going to keep score as we claw our way through this mess. Look at your kids, look at your grandkids, look at the young people here. All that matters is whether people are better off when you quit than when you started and whether those kids have a brighter future. And to do that, people have to be coming together instead of being torn apart. As in one of Hillary's favorite phrases, all the rest is background music. Play the main theme. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Thank you.